Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. It's sound. You might think it's very loud in the background, but it's not. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Daniel. Hello, Ashley. Good afternoon, Jenna. Good afternoon, Ashley. Oh, funny. Good afternoon, Camilla. All right. Um, hello, Nikaya. Hello, Sam. Hello, Jenna. Hello. I think that's it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start in a second. We are, we are going to have, oh, oh, you do remember right, but no, I'm going to change that. Sorry. Um, well, let me, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Direct check. We, um, we are going to get started in a moment. In fact, I'm going to, ah, okay, thank you. And thank you for your thank you. I will definitely, that's awesome. Okay, hang on everybody for one second. Okay. Um, Okay, let me, so here's the, here's the basic deal, or hello everybody if I missed any, I think that's, it seems like actually maybe a slightly smaller class than usual. Um, okay, I want to, I want to get, I want to do this Doppler effect thing in a nice, organized, not frantic, not interrupted, not broken down fashion. Um, in short, I feel, I'm very impressed with any of you who was able to hold on in any way to your attention and thoughts in the last class. I think the last class was quite fraught. Um, um, for that, and hope, and I think it's, I think we're in a different environment as we often are on Thursdays. I think it's quiet in here. I have, I got a new <laughs> electronic device. Um, we should, I, I can't I can't promise it'll be the most exciting class ever, but I think this should be a calm, clear class where we're clearly going to go through some methodically, we're going to go through all four cases of the Doppler effect. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. We're going to go through two cases of the Doppler effect. And you will, I think, have see very clearly how to extrapolate from two cases to the other two cases. That is sort of your job. Lab, um, but uh, um, long way of saying, um, I, I want to address at least one person in the direct chat has um, very impressively remembered that at one point I had mentioned a midterm it was supposed to be coming up soon. Um, we do still have to have a midterm, a midterm exam. Um, it was going to be next week. I'm going to postpone that. Um, I want to make. Before we have a midterm, first of all, I want to make sure that we have a week of time with a practice exam and with total. Oh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. One second. Oh, no problem. Wait, no problem. But everybody can hear me now, right? Are you, I mean, I think you, no one's missed anything if. Uh, oh, okay, wait. Wait, can everybody hear me now? Now I'm confused, actually. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, so look, so there's not gonna be a midterm next week. There's, there's, the midterm is not next week. We still have to have a midterm. I mean, I suppose realistically, it may have to be the week after that, um, but, le but maybe, it will, let me get, because I guess we are getting close to Thanksgiving and all of that. I will get back to you with details, but I guarantee you all that once there's a midterm, you'll have a practice exam put in your streams approximately a week before that midterm you'll have time to do the practice exam you'll have at least a class session to ask me questions about the practice midterm 
And for me to answer them, we'll have at least a class session where we're directly confronting like exactly any concerns appertaining to the midterm, et cetera. And um, I did not feel that we've had adequate time to do that this week. And I was not happy with class two days ago. I'm not, not with regard to any of you, of course, but um, um, so I wanna make sure we're, we're back in a more feeling. Basically, if we went away after yesterday and then I announced the midterm, I think if I were a student, I would feel very stressed um, uh, and rattled by that. So I wanna get things more um, aligned to the material and to like calmness before we're worried about a midterm. So there's, so I'm just saying, and if you weren't even thinking about this at all, then I'm not bringing this up in order to get you stressed. But it is true that I had said there was gonna be a midterm next week. I'm just saying now, no, there's no midterm next week. When it's coming more closely, we will directly address it. Um, yeah, I guess you could assume for planning purposes that it would very possibly be the week after next, although Lord knows that's probably Thanksgiving. Um, so now what, so, oh, does the Wi-Fi cut out? Oh, it might be on my, um, let me know if the Wi-Fi keeps, let me see something. I'm not sure if there's anything I can do about the Wi-Fi on my end. Do let me know. Uh, oh, I know it is public. Ashley or anybody else, if if this is spotty, I mean, there's one thing I, I can try to move. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, I'll be aware anyway. Today, I really want things to be clear today because I know Tuesdays are always a little bit funky and Thursday is sort of a chance to be less funky. So, so let me know if there's something I could do, but, 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 okay. Um, so anyway, just in case anybody's just tuned in or what I'm saying is do not worry about a midterm right now. There is, there's not a midterm next week. We're just doing the material right now. Um, and the material that I want to do, I want to just systematically solve a Doppler effect problem partly to show you how to do it. Often there is a Doppler effect problem on the midterm. It's a, it has a, it's a pretty important thing to know how to understand. Um, so I'm partly going to walk you through one example to show you how to do it. Also to point out some implications of it. Um, also, it does tend to come up in lab. It, um, so it will help with that. Um, so I want, to go back to exactly where we were yesterday, um, we had, and again, and, and yesterday what I tried to do, not yesterday, Tuesday what I tried to do was sort of in English break down why I had all these equations written here and what they were all meant, even though they're all sort of the same equation written a bunch of different ways. Again, I don't know if that was useful or not, but, but, but today if you wanna see what the real implications of the equations are, we're just gonna use them today. Um, so it should become more concrete just in context. So what I'm going to do right now is remind you of the exact sample problem we're doing, which is this.
Okay. So, okay. So uh, please tell me if I got any of the numbers, if I mistakenly wrote numbers wrong here, but I believe this is the problem that we had set up. I'd actually set up at the end of last Thursday and we were trying to sort of talk about it Tuesday, but I talked about it in the abstract. I, I want to solve it today. First of all, just look quickly and see if any of the numbers, if I got any of the numbers wrong. I don't, I don't think I did, but please do let me know if I did. Um, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Um, um, notice a couple of things now that I have a stylus again, it could be calmer. Notice it just, okay, notice th this is going to be one example. It's, of course, it's just an example, right? Numbers are different from example to example. B but number one, it is a realistic example. The Well, for the most part, these numbers are realistic. 40 meters per second for the speed of a receiver relative to air. Well, you know, that, that's a little bit over 80 miles an hour. So this is like a highway example of the Doppler. You know, this is something you might experience on a highway or something. So maybe not on a city street or in your apartment, but nonetheless, absolutely realistic, you know, for planet Earth. Um, number two, notice um, we, the way I tend to draw these things, you know, I tend to draw sort of like a speaker thing that indicates the source of the sound. Oh, and maybe I should. Yeah. And remember, again, this I tried to say Tuesday, the letter S. I'm, well, maybe I will write this very quickly. Hold on. Okay. Oh, oh, question? Or no? No, okay. Um, so I'm using initials S for source, R for receiver, um, media, M for medium, W for wave, the standard notation I would use it for any wave that we've been discussing. Oh, let me say again, also, this effect that we're about to look at, I mean, the mathematics of it, the, the implications of it, it, it applies to any wave at all, any wave can experience a Doppler effect. And when it experiences a Doppler effect, it works the way that we're about to say. Um, we're tending to picture sound waves. They're the possibly the most familiar, common, and reliable example of a sound wave, um, of a Doppler effect. Um, ultimately, I think the implications of the Doppler effect are most pronounced and most uh, sort of head spinning when it comes to light. I mean, just to be clear, light, when it behaves like a wave or when we believe it's behaving like a wave, which is a thing unto itself, um, that in those cases, light can um, undergo a Doppler effect. Most specifically, starlight can experience a Doppler effect. So you might want to have in the back of your mind, as I'm talking about this, that anything I'm saying here can, can translate directly to light as well. Um, since I tend to be talking about sound, I tend to make the source look like a, like a speaker and the receiver to look like an ear or something. I mean, as stupid as that is, but th that, that's what they're supposed to be representing. But um, 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 uh, but the numbers again are realistic for sound waves. That is, I'm what's given here in the problem is that the velocity of the wave relative to the medium, like the, the, the bottom line written there, VWM, velocity of wave relative to medium is approximately 340 meters per second. That indeed is what the velocity of sound relative to its medium of air is. Um, when air is at standard temperature and pressure, okay, that and 500 hertz is a realistic frequency for a sound wave. I mean, 440 hertz is middle A on a piano. I think we mentioned that on Monday. I can't remember. Um, 256 is middle C on a piano. 500 is a, very much a realistic number. It's like an A sharp or maybe even a B. I can't remember um, on a piano. So these are okay. Lastly, I want to say as I start to solve this. This is what I would call an example of one out of four cases for the Doppler effect. I think there's four standard cases. There can be other combinations as well, but four standard. And by that, I mean either the receiver ap approaching the source, that's that would be one case. The receiver receding, going away from the source would be another case, or the source approaching or the source receding. Now the ultimate concept had better be the same, 
But the numbers do work out differently for the different cases. And indeed, I think once you know how to do a couple of cases, you should be able to make a minor adjustment to do any of the cases. We're here doing one of the cases. We're doing a case where the receiver recedes. Okay, and we're going to do the math. And I don't know why I'm posting. We're going to do the math in one second. But like final thing to say about it, as we were trying to say Tuesday, is what you should expect just looking at this setup like if you understand this diagram the way I hope, the way I'm wanting you to understand it, then you what you're seeing is a speaker just sitting around or a parked car, some source of sound sitting around in the air and emanating, emanating these sound waves. Um, you're seeing a receiver that in this case happens to be not sitting in the air, but in fact moving through the air in a direction away from the sound source, right? And be, because at least one of these two objects has motion relative to the medium for this wave, because of one of these objects, the source or the receiver, is not in the same frame of reference as the medium for the wave, then we are going to experience a Doppler effect. We'll see it in the numbers in a minute. And what that means is we are going to find that the frequency of the wave as measured by the receiver, FWR, the blue thing that has question marks after it right there, we're going to find that that will not equal FWS, like the receiver and the source will experience, observe, measure two different frequencies for the same wave. That's the Doppler effect right there. The conditions for the Doppler effect are our source of wave and receive, excuse me, the conditions for the Doppler effect are source and or receiver of wave being in different frame of reference from medium or source and or receiver for wave moving relative to medium. That's the condition required for a Doppler effect. And the effect itself is source and receiver obtaining two different measurements with regard to wave frequency, right? That's where the Doppler effect is going to be guaranteed. This guy is not going to hear the note that was played by the other guy. And they're both going to be right. Like I said, Tuesday, we're, we're going to find out what the number is, what the discrepancy is. You might, and, it, and if the receiver weren't moving at all, with respect to the medium, if both of them weren't moving at all with respect to the medium, then there wouldn't be any Doppler effect and they would both agree on the frequency. The frequencies would be the same, you know, 500, 500. Here, since there's motion, the frequencies are going to be different. I think you might even guess from that or infer and, and correctly. So you would correctly infer that the greater the motion of either of these two objects relative to the medium, the greater the motion, the more dramatic a Doppler effect we're going to have. That is to say, the numbers are going to differ by a greater amount if the velocities differ by a greater amount. If you were to guess that, you'd be right. The last thing that you can guess before we even dive into the numbers, we said this yesterday, is that this FWR that we're going to get is definitely going to be lower than the F. WS that was sent out. In this case, it's going to be lower. I know that because the receiver is receding because this happens to be a case. I mean, you know, I don't, you can call it case two, case one. I don't care what you call the cases, but this is the case of receiver receding. It's moving away from the source. And when I picture that just physically, and I want you to do this, like before we start crunching the numbers, picture, you know, this is someone like standing at the beach at Coney Island, Far Rockaway, running away from the waves as the waves come to hit him or her. If you were to run away from waves as they come to you, you would interact with them less often than if you just stood still and let them hit you, right? You wouldn't interact with them less often than they were sent. You would, I mean, I mean yes, you would, I'm sorry. You, you, um, they wouldn't be sent any less often, but you would interact with them less often, right? If you were running away. You the frequency of receiving would be different from the frequency of sending, and it would be lower if you were running away. That's what's going to happen here conceptually. But as to what the actual numbers are, we're going to run them right now and see. Okay, so we're going to start the calculation. It's like, but this is our goal, right? Our goal, and please stop me, if, especially today, since I think I can hear you and you can hear me. 
please, again, since I'm still feeling a little bit like yesterday was not clear, please stop me if anything's not clear. But I'm about to solve the problem now. I'm going to do the thing I conceptually told you to do on Tuesday. And the way I'm going to, I'm going to do one thing Before I start any Doppler effect problem, what I always do is assign a coordinate system. I assign positive and negative to certain directions. Very important, actually, always important in physics, but particularly important if you're ever dealing in a situation where there's more than one reference frame and where you're really deploying Galileo's principle of relativity when you're really choosing a reference frame and trying to be consistent with it and realizing that your choice of reference frame is going to make a difference in velocity. It's very important to explicitly assign directionality to your reference frame. So I'm, and, and, and you'll see, especially because this is what we were stumbling over a little bit. There was a minus sign that we stumbled over a little bit at the end of Tuesday. What I'm going to do right now before I run any calculations is I'm going to say the direction I, and this is what I always do. No matter what case it is, I'm going to assign uh, the left to right direction as positive, not because it's left to right. What I'm assigning is the direction that the wave is traveling from source to receiver. I'm calling that positive before I do anything else. And please note that it's like actually super important. It will make a difference in all of your numbers. Note what I'm doing. In fact, note this. The, the wave is actually coming out of that source in all directions. Like it's not in the pit, the, like the wave really is going like this. It's going everywhere, right? But I only care about the, the ripplets, the wavelets, the, 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 the pulses. I only care about the pulses of the wave that actually make the journey from the speaker to the receiver. I only care about those intervening, you, you know, I only care about these guys. Those guys are traveling to the right. I'm going to call to the right positive. The direction of the actual wave from source to receiver, I'm going to call positive. Therefore, every calculation that is explicitly about the wave won't have to have any negative signs in it. It's going to make that very nice and clean. But anything that goes against that direction, anything that goes against that direction is going to be negative. And you're going to see there is going to be something that's going to go against that direction. So I'm assigning that to positive, okay? And I always, that's like step one of any Doppler effect problem. Okay, now we'll turn the page.
Okay. The true first step of a Doppler effect is what we're about to do together. We're going to solve for the wavelength of the wave according to the source. And then, and this, you know, that's what the subscripts mean, right? We're going to solve. I'm, I'm, I'm reading down at the bottom of the page right here. I'm going to go back and read the top notes in a second. But the bottom step, I mean, the bottom of the page says step one, use V equals lambda F, that standard equation, to solve for lambda sub WS. The subscripts mean reference frames, right? So we're going to solve for the wavelength of the wave relative to the source, as measured by the source, according to the source. Please note, it doesn't mean the wavelength of the wave at the location of the source. These are not locations. These are frames of reference. These are according to the, the measurements of assuming that what this really means is find the wavelength of the wave, assuming that the source is sitting still, like use a measuring equipment that is not running past the source in one direction or another. It doesn't have anything to do with location. It has everything to do with velocity is what these subscripts mean, okay? And that's what we're gonna do right now. Note a couple of things here. Before you do that, you should assign a coordinate system like I did, that's step zero, assign a plus or a minus like I did. But then also I have to say a quick thing, I mean, this is kind of serious, step 0 0.5. There is an equation all over the web for the Doppler effect, I'm aware of that. It's an equation that looks like it's gonna be a lot easier to use than this whole full class that I'm teaching on this. It looks like an equation where you could just plug in the numbers and then you don't have to pay attention to all this. And, and look, and, but I'm telling you, ignore that. And this is not a threat on my part. And it's also, I'm not trying to say like, here's a big piece of cake, don't eat it. Like you can use that equation if you want. And I'm not saying that it's moral cheating or something. I'm telling you right now from years of experience, if you just try to plug into that equation to get answers, and you don't pay attention to this whole procedure and stuff, you will quickly get into a situation where you don't actually know what's going on, where you don't actually know what to make plus or minus. And where, where even though it looks like you're just plugging in, that knowing what to plug in where turns out to be much more difficult than it seems. And it becomes much more of a coin toss, whether you get Doppler effect problems right or wrong. I don't say that in most about most equations. I love equations, okay? But I am warning you from years of experience that the standard equation for the Doppler effect that's all over the web is very, very misleading. It also absolutely obfuscates any understanding at all. Like all that has to happen on an exam, this has happened many times, is if, if I ask you a slightest conceptual question or, or a question that's not a direct plug and chug of that thing, then it, things will fall apart cognitively. The, re, the Doppler effect has really cool, cool, important conceptual implications that are utterly not captured by that equation that's everywhere on the web. So again, so you can use it. I'm not saying, you know, you can use it. You can put in your arsenal. You could certainly use it as a check. That would be great. You can, once you understand all this, you can do it both ways and have that much more knowledge in your brain. But I'm just, and if you do use it, if you just use it, I'm not, I would never, I can't ethically punish you for that. But I'm telling everybody that in case you're poking around or if I'm boring you or whatever, do not be misled by the Doppler effect equation that's in textbooks on on the web. It does not help nearly as much as it looks like it might, okay? And this, I think, this explanation and the one that you'll need in lab two will break things down for you much better than that equation will. Anyway, okay, so step one is you're gonna use V equals lambda F to solve for lambda sub WS. So, okay, here we go, step one. Okay, so I'm just taking the equation, you know, so.
Okay, step one is we're gonna solve for the wavelength according to the source, like we said Tuesday. We're gonna do that because wavelength is gonna be the one characteristic of the wave that is not, that is going to be agreed upon by everybody, source and receiver alike. Um, now we, we the, what is given is the frequency according to the source. That's the other thing. So it makes sense to start our understanding with the source. The frequency of the source is given. The, so we're gonna say, fine, wavelength equals speed over frequency. That's straightforward. We're just gonna note, this is the thing I was saying abstractly on Tuesday. We're gonna note that the speed of the wave according to the source, you might think you know it and you might even be right, but it's not strictly explicitly a given, right? What's given in the Doppler effect problem is what's always given, which is the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. That's the thing that's always given because that's what we actually can know about a wave. Like even before it's shot out, like that's sort of the exciting conclusion of two weeks ago that we're trying to reinforce here is that once you specify the medium for a wave, you know its speed automatically and you know its speed is not going to change. It's going to be a constant speed that is fully determined by the material properties of that medium. So we know, oh, it's sound going through air. Oh, it's 340 meters per second. But to air is what we know. We know that sound travels at 340 meters per second relative to the air through which it's traveling. That's what we know. So in other words, calculation, and that's all we know off the bat. So calculation-wise, what I'm saying is, like, we don't know VWS, we know VWM, but we know Galileo's principle of relativity. We know that, that VWS can be Oh, sorry, sorry. Wait, why am I? Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Sorry. Okay, this is the key step. It, it, I mean, this is like the hardest part of the whole problem in a weird way. It's particularly hard because it seems unnecessary and because there's going to be a zero that I'm going to plug in a second. It's going to make you think, why do you even bother? The reason I'm doing this step is because there isn't always a zero, first of all. And second of all, because this is the exact step that I'm going to do. I mean, this is the exact mini step that I'm going to do again when I then transfer my knowledge over to the reference frame of the receiver and calculate there. In other words, please note, we don't know the velocity of the wave relative to the source explicitly, but what we do know is velocity of, we know in general, VAB plus VBC equals VAC. We know in general about, we know about the relativity of velocities. We know what I would call GPR form number four. We know that in all directions and at all speeds, velocities add like vectors, as long as you honor the relativistic character of velocities. That is, we know velocity of me relative to subway plus velocity of subway relative to street gives you, gives me velocity of me relative to streets, right? We, this is very important. This is what I mean. And this was what was written on the first page, the top equation on the first page of notes today, where it says VAC equals VAB plus VBC. That is a truth about velocities in general, that is Galilean relativity, that does not just assume waves, that assumes like anything, baseballs, electrons, planets, blah, blah. It's saying that velocities add like vectors as long as you respect their relational character. In other words, you can't add two velocities from the same reference frame and expect to get anything meaningful. You cannot, right? Baseball flying past my, like I could throw a baseball right now and I could throw a pen. And we could ask, what's the speed of the baseball relative to the room plus the speed of the pen relative to the room? We could ask that and we could take numbers and add the numbers together. If we wanted, we could even like use vector components and add the two velocities. 
but we wouldn't get anything that represents anything meaningful in the physical world. It doesn't mean anything to add the speed of a pen plus the speed of a baseball. If they're both measured in the same room, it's just like, what, what does that get you? Nothing. But you can add the speed of a baseball relative to the room plus the speed of the room relative to the planet. Say if the room were in like a moving train car or the room were you know, on the love boat or something like that, right? You can add the velocity of an object to its reference object. You can add that to the velocity of the reference object in relation to some third object. And what you get kind of like transitivity, you get the velocity of the first object relative to the third. That's why you ride subways, right? So you can sit still on the subway, do nothing, take a break, not be moving relative to the subway. But since the subway is moving relative to your apartment building, then at the end of the day, you have moved relative to your apartment building and or it has moved relative to you, right? In fact, right? That's what I'm using. And that's true of any three objects at all. So what I'm saying here is let the three objects of our consideration be source, medium, uh, and wave, sorry, wave, medium, and source in this case. And I'm saying, although I may not explicitly know, and explicitly, like it may not have been given in the problem what the wave is doing relative to the source. I do know what the wave is doing relative to the medium. I do know what the medium is doing relative to the source. Get to that in a second. That is zero. And I can add those together to get the velocity of the wave relative to the source. In fact, that's so I, I am going to say, in other words, I'm not trying to keep you in suspense. It is true that in this case, this is zero. So this calculation won't be hard if you're sitting around. In other words, I'm saying, yes, the velocity of the sound relative to the source is 340, the number that you might have been thinking the whole time. But because strictly speaking, it's 340 plus zero, the velocity of the sound relative to the speaker is 340 because the velocity of the sound is 340 relative to air and the air is not doing anything interesting relative to the speaker. If you're with me, you'll see that the reason I have to be explicit about this calculation every time is in two out of four cases, the speaker would be moving and that number wouldn't be zero. Furthermore, I'm going to do this exact same calculation onto the receiver in a couple of minutes and there's going to be a non-zero there. So this is an important concern. Before I even go on, well, so, so I'll say, well, okay. Um, so, so I haven't finished the problem yet. What I've done right there is I finished step one. What I've calculated right there is the wavelength of the wave according to the source, according to the source. The wavelength is 0.680 meters. Again, that's a real number. It's like a, you know, a little bit more than a half a meter from crest to crest, from compression to compression in this, in this sound packet that's traveling. Its wavelength is about 0 0.680 meters. I'm not done with the problem. I'm done with step one. Let me just, but before I move to step two, let me just make something clear.
Okay, just to make this. Okay, just um, because we're going to use it throughout. Again, this is Galileo's principle of relativity. There's many different ways of saying Galileo's principle of relativity. This is what I call the fourth form of principle of relativity. It's it's the mathematical way of seeing or the computational way of seeing the implications of the velo the relative character velocity. So just one way to keep it really concrete, at least in my mind, maybe in your notes, is I'm saying what we're saying here is if you've got three arbitrary objects, A, B, and C, and they have three arbitrary but distinct constant velocities, like so something's going like that, something's going like that, and something's going like that, all in different speeds. The what this is saying is if you just have one object. You, velocity is meaningless. The velocity of a single object to itself is always zero, right? The velo like it, this is all saying velocity is always a comparison. If you just compare one object to itself, you say, what's its velocity not compared to anything else? Well, you're going to get zero every time, right? The velocity of my hand relative to it, to my hand is zero. It's always with itself. If you, so you need at least two objects to talk about velocity, two objects A and B. What the second line says is, once you only just have two objects, velocity is perfectly symmetric. If you know the velocity of the Earth is going 65,000 miles an hour to the west past the sun, then the sun is going 65,000 miles an hour to the east past the Earth. They are necessarily, it is necessarily a symmetric relationship. So the velocity of A relative to B is always the negative of the velocity of B relative to A. And all these assume velocity is a vector, meaning I could be talking about it in any number of directions, right? So negative means flip the vector. It means if something's, if I'm going Northeast relative to you, then you're going Southwest relative to me, right? At the exact same angle. So that's what the, the second little Roman numeral means. And then the third one finally says, now, if you really want to talk velocity in an interesting way, right? If you only have one object, it's always zero. If you only have two objects, then velocity is just a mirror image of itself always. If you want to get into where it's like interesting and, and you know unexpected, then you have to have three objects. And what we say with three objects is the velocity of one relative to the next, plus the velocity of the next relative to the third, will give you the velocity of the first relative to the third. That's what we're saying here. I just want to put this in one big package for everybody because we're actually using all of these implications in a way when we apply this to the Doppler effect. When we apply this to waves, like this is true of motion in general. But when we apply it to waves, we get this thing called the Doppler effect. Okay, so that's what I was just doing. Here in step one, when I calculated the wavelength of the sound according to the reference frame of the sound source. Now, and again, stop me if you want more time. Okay, now I. All right, now I go to step two. Now, step two will almost strike you as a joke. Step two is just saying this. Now, I'm just stating this. I'm saying. Okay, always in physics, you know, when everything, 
when a bunch of things are changing or varying or disagreeing, what we're always looking for is what's the constant, what's the invariant, what is the thing we can rely on while underneath the surface, while lots of things on the surface are varying. So I'm saying here in a Doppler effect, in any Doppler effect problem, the key point to me is that wavelength and only wavelength is the characteristic that everybody's going to agree on the source and receiver. And again, just physically picture that. I mean, if you're if waves are coming in at the ocean, uh, at the beach, you standing on the sand, you can do whatever you want. You can run toward those waves. You can run away from the waves. You can stand still. And you, and by doing that, hopefully you see that you'd be observing, you'd be putting yourself in different frames of reference and observing all different kinds of wave speeds and therefore wave frequencies. But you're not going to do anything to affect the wavelength. Like if each, and that's, in a way, why we call it wavelength, like why we can even say that there's a such thing as a length of a wave is that that gap between two crests of the wave, between any two successive crests or troughs or whatever, that gap is a gap that holds steady, not from here to there and from this perspective and that perspective, right? I mean, they're just the, the, uh, the waves are going to be two meters apart, even if you're running into them. I, th I can't really say it more clearly than that. I'm sure I could, but I'm sure somebody could. But um, anyway, the wavelength is going to be constant. It's going to be invariant. It's going to be the same measurement, whether measured by receiver or source. And that's going to be true every single time. So I'm writing this down as a step, almost as to make this whole problem solution into like a proof or a derivation or something. I'm just, like, in other words, this is if you get what I'm saying right now, it's true in all the cases. It is step two every time. I'm just writing down WR equal uh, uh, lambda WR equals lambda WS. Now, why did I do that? Well, I'm, that allows me then to go on to step three. Okay, I'm gonna go, go to step three now. Um, and I'm gonna, so I, I use the source to compute the wavelength at, let me back up again. What I really did was at the source, I looked at the source frame reference first and I used the frequency which was given for the source. I used the frequency according to the source to figure out the wavelength according to the source. I did that so I can now go to the receiver and use the wavelength according to the receiver, which because it's the same, I just figured it out. I'm going to use the wavelength according to the receiver to backtrack and figure out the frequency according to the receiver. If you're following me at all, it should almost sound to you like I'm going in a circle. It should almost, and it does sound like I'm going in a circle. I use frequency to get wavelength at the source, and then I use wavelength to get frequency at the receiver. It sounds like I'm just backtracking and I'm going to end up where I started, except that the way I'm figuring everything out is through velocities, and the velocity is precisely what the source and receiver don't agree on, and that's going to make all the difference. Here's what I mean. Right. Again, I'm doing literally the same procedures before. I'm going to, I mean, backwards. I'm looking for the frequency. So frequency is going to be velocity divided by wavelength, just like before. Well, before we said wavelength was velocity divided by frequency. And then I stop and I say to myself, hang on, VWR, the velocity. And honestly, this is where people often get this wrong. Like, it may seem to me that I already know a velocity. It may seem to me that I have a velocity that I can plug in. It may seem to me that the velocity is 340. But no, note again, what was the, what I never, the thing that was given the whole time was the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. 
That's the one thing that was given in this contrived problem because it's the one thing that could ever be known in a real problem, in, a, in, a, in an actual natural phenomenon. What we know going in is the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. That's what's fixed. That's what no one could do anything about. And everything else that we know we would infer from Galileo's principle of relativity. In other words, so really, please do notice I'm doing the exact same thing I did in step one, putting in the subscripts and matching them up in the right pattern. Also, and please notice this. I, one of the reasons that that equation, the Galileo's principle of relativity four number four, why it was written at the top of the very first page of these notes, and then why I sort of wrote it again two pages ago is it has A, B, and C in it, right? It's our, it is about any three objects in the world that you want at all. So in this, in our, and we're using it two different ways here in this problem. We used it to refer to the wave, medium, and source before. Now we're using it to refer to the wave, medium, and receiver. Right? It could be any three objects, but the, but the point is for you to add their velocities, the objects have to be arranged in a proper sequence. Velocity of A relative to B plus velocity of B relative to C gives you velocity of A relative to C. Now, it doesn't matter what A, B, and C stand for, but it does matter that you arrange them in, with that self-consistent order. And that's what I'm applying here. So I'm just writing down the arrangement of velocities in the numerator that works. I'm not looking yet at what I actually know, or I'm not filling in the numbers yet. I'm just saying WM plus MR equals WR just by the pattern of subscripts, okay? So that's what I wrote down. Now I'll think about putting numbers in. I'm just gonna recopy it on the next page. Professor? Yes. Is the VMR supposed to be VWR in the numerator? No. Wait, great question. Hold on. Great. I shouldn't say no like that. Fantastic question. Fantastic question. But actually, the answer is no. And that's actually what I was just about to sort of try to be as clear as I can about. Let me let me go back for a second. Um, it's not. In other words, um, it's not, but that's what I have to be careful because, okay, hold on. What I'm really saying here, actually, let me go back. So I'm oh, saying- fine. I got it. Oh, you sure? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. No, but, that, but no, that, that is really a great question. I know I sound rude and to every, and really, and I mean this, you should submit that for, like you should triple dipple, triple dipple. You should triple dip that for points. like. Put that in, even even the even though I said like, or because I said no, you get to put that in the points thing for like being really really wrong for eleven points. But you're not really wrong. It's a great question. I'm going to explain that. You're going to see why in a minute. You're not as confused as you think you are. I mean, well, okay. I'm going to explain. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to bring this up to everybody now. Um, um, really. Uh, okay. So so here's the point, folks. Like to Luna's thing and to everybody. Notice at the bottom of this page that I'm showing right now, it says VAC equals VAB plus VBC, right? And that's just the pattern. I mean, again, I think if you picture yourself on a subway, that pattern makes sense. Or if you picture yourself like the velocity of me relative to Earth plus the velocity of Earth relative to the sun gives me the velocity of me relative to the sun. Like it is act. Or let me give you one last even better example. Maybe I've said this before, maybe I haven't. Like if you go to an escalator, like in Columbus, like in a subway station, like Columbus Circle or something, or, or just in a mall, right? You just go to an escalator. You really know, especially when you're a little kid, 
you really know this thing is true. You certainly know it's true when zeros are involved. Like you certainly know that if you just stand on the escalator and go zero relative to the escalator, while the escalator goes 20 miles an hour relative to the mall, then you'll move 20 miles an hour, you know, through the mall. But, but please also know, and this is to everybody, and it's not just because Luna just said anything, even though I'm thrilled that she did. Like notice that when you get on an escalator, if you're from New York and you're like doing your thing and there's tourists, like on the, hopefully standing on the right side of the escalator, although they'll probably stand on the left side of their tourists, right? You're in a rush, you get on the left side and you start booking, right? Think about what you're doing when you do that. When you think you can pass the tourists and get to where you're going faster, which you totally can, right? What you're really thinking is, I'm gonna go one mile an hour relative to the escalator, but the escalator is going 20 miles an hour relative to the mall. So I'm gonna go 21 miles an hour through the mall. Like I'm gonna get where I'm going faster because I, the speed of me relative to the escalator will add to the speed of the escalator relative to the mall. And I will get through the mall faster. Like you're passing people on the escalator because speeds actually do add because your speed matters. And so does the escalator speed, right? And you even really know if you're a little kid or you're like one of my two sons, you know from experience that if you try to run up the down escalator, the crap still works, right? The reason it's fun, I think, to run up a down escalator or down an up escalator is that it's not just the speeds that add, it's the velocities, like taking into account negative signs, right? So you know that if the escalator is going up at 20 miles an hour relative to the mall, you can try to like go down the escalator at negative 20 miles an hour, like relative to the escalator. And if you try hard enough and you match it, right? Like then your dad or whatever, your mom can stand somewhere in the mall and watch you and see you pull off that weirdo, like roadrunners weird thing where like your legs are moving and you're sweating. But from the perspective of the mall, there's just this dude or dudette, but in my case, I have two sons. There's just this like person standing in the escalator going like this while the escalator goes down relative to the mall and they're going up relative to the escalator. So their legs are moving and they're getting nowhere, right? I mean, you, I think you all like know, velocities really add this way, even taking into account or especially taking into account minus signs. And it turns out even if they're all at cockamamie angles, they add via their vector components. So it's like, this is a truth about velocities in general. So then what I'm doing, right? And I'm saying it's true as long as you add in the proper sequence. If you say me to you plus you to her equals me to her like that. So here back in the problem, what I'm doing, and this is very important. I mean, you're gonna see in a second, again, this is why it's really good, honestly, that Luna brought this up or at least even just directed our attention to it. Um, is, that, is that, yeah, like, uh, well, is that right here, if I want VWR, like I don't have VWR explicitly. I might think that I have an intuition as to what it probably should be, but you know, honestly, we should be careful. Like our intuition can get a little funky when it comes to the negative signs here, excuse me. So what I know is that what I have in the problem explicitly is VWM. What I want is VWR. Like, like I know how fast the, the, the wave is moving relative to its medium. What I want to know is how fast and in what direction is the wave moving relative to it, the receiver. So what I'm doing here in the numerator, what I'm doing in the numerator is I'm just putting letters together that in the correct order that they need to be put together in order to add velocities. Like I'm literally writing VWM plus VMR just because I know from from the other page i know that v, vwm plus vmr should like my transitivity by form four should sum up to give me what i want which is vwr like what i want is vwr so i wrote down letters in an order that matters frankly just to be clear i could have written down vwz plus vzr that would work as well. Like the letters are in the correct order to make VWR. It's just that I don't, I don't know what Z is. I don't know anything about Z. So I used like letters that I have here. But now look, this is really where the Luna thing comes in. I wrote down what I think is right. VWM plus VMR is going to give me F, I mean, excuse me, it's going to give me VWR. But, okay, so this is where it says, let's be careful.
Oh, cool. Well, thank you. Oh, awesome. No, I'm psyched. And thank you. And really do submit it for 10,000 million points. I mean, I think it's like, I think it's like 11 plus eight plus it's a lot of points. Please do. Um, but good, but thank you. Oh yeah, now it's like even more points because you said that makes sense, thank you. So you just closed the conversation. Literally, there's like four portals. You can just put that same submission in. I don't know why this excites me so much, but because I secretly would rather this be a video game than a class, I suppose, but please do. Because um, I'm excited when people aren't dead, that's why. Okay, so here's what I'm saying now to everybody. Please know, and this is, this is probably the wrinkle. This is probably why we're having class all today. It's about this one little wrinkle that I'm showing you right now, that isn't a wrinkle if you get this whole procedure, but this, this is about to be a minus sign issue. That, and it's the minus signs that get people in Doppler effects really. And it's the minus signs that get really messed up if you just use that equation on the web, I'm telling you. But so here's the deal. In our original picture, in the original situation, we were told that a receiver was, was, was moving through the wind, through the air, was running away from the speaker at 40 meters per second. And I was just putting numbers in that original picture. I hadn't decided positives or negatives yet in that picture. But if you, if you think about what we assigned, we said anything going in the direction of the wave is positive. So VRM, that in this case, in this case that we're doing, where the, where the receiver was moving away from the source, the receiver was moving in the same direction, was moving through the air in the same direction as the wave itself, right? Because we happen to be doing that case because the numbers happen to be presented to us that way. Then the velocity of the receiver relative to the medium was positive 40, positive. Like it was, we were just told it's 40, but I know it's positive because the wave is going that way and the receiver is going that same way, positive. So VRM, VRM, is positive 40, right? But now that's what I happen to know is VRM. That's what's given in the problem. But what this equation is asking me for is VMR. And that's not because I made a mistake. It's sure, like it almost, it looks like, it's not because I made a mistake. It's because that's what the equation demands. Like if I want to add some velocities together to get VWR, what I have to add together, if I'm being careful about the sequencing here is VWM plus VMR. We don't have VMR, we have VRM. So we did, but, but, but we look, this is why I sort of took the sidebar to remind us like all of these pieces I think really do make sense. I think every one of you knows each like little thing that I'm about to say, it's just, it's a matter of keeping them all in the right bins for a problem like this. Notice the second part, like the implication of Galileo's principle of relativity is that if I'm going past you to the east at 65,000 miles an hour, then you're going past me to the west at 65,000 miles an hour. Right, exactly. Yes, now she gets 400 points, 400,000 points. Yes, Luna, and I'm glad it's Luna. Yes, that's my point. That is exactly right. I could retire now, except then my sons can't afford college. Um, and But who are we kidding? Because by the time they go to college, college is just an app on your phone. And like a little guy like me jumping out and yelling and giving you a grade. Okay, um, 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 yes. So Luna's point is, so the point is that is, is that Luna's right?
Okay, couple. So we okay, actually have an answer. That's number one. That's nice. Um, so number one, I'm saying, as long as we're so if we're clear and consistent and careful about really like what what did we just do? We just applied Galileo's principle of relativity. We just applied the relativity of velocities to the motion of a wave, and we got this Doppler effect. Like our final answer is that the oh, I should say, I'm sorry. Our final answer is yeah. The frequency of the wave as measured by the receiver is 442 hertz, as opposed to the 500 hertz of frequency that the source measured. And again, and they're both right. Like they would hear two different sounds because they're in two different reference frames, okay? Um, and notice that this answer that we got 442 is lower than 500 because the, the receiver is moving away. Um, it's lower than 500 and it's substantially lower than 500 because 40 is a substantial number in comparison to 340. Like the faster you're going relative to or compared to the speed of the wave itself, the more of a difference it's gonna make, okay? So, and so that's the answer. And notice also, please, like what, what is, all we did, I mean, I talk a lot because I'm trying to make it clear, right? But if you step back and, and again, I apologize to some of you people may really have, tried this last night, you might, you might have seen the whole thing. And I'm sorry if I'm talking about it too much. I really am. I mean, but it, it took me a while to get this. And what I want you to see if you step back and look at the procedure we just did, first of all, I guarantee you that the procedure we just did, it, it's a lot faster than it sounds when I'm talking about it. And it is really just two steps of work. And it's those two steps of work that you do would be the exact same two steps, no matter what case we're talking about. We're gonna quickly do, I know we have like six minutes left, I'm at least gonna set up another case to show you, but you literally, if you trust this procedure, if it makes sense, which I think it does, it will work no matter what case you're talking about. And the hardest part of the procedure is making decisions about zeros and minus signs. But if you really take seriously Galileo's principle, if you take serious, then it will always make the, you'll always know how to make the minus signs decisions correctly. So, okay, I'm, I'm gonna quickly, and I hope, but stop me if there's questions. I, I will tell you right away that if, if, you, if we change the case to making the receiver, well, here, I'll stop right in the notes. Okay, very quickly, I know we have like, we have four minutes left. I'm gonna say the sort of easy thing to extrapolate from this or to see if you really get it in a check. If you do the next case, if you do the case of the receiver coming in, it'll be literally the exact same thing. Every number will be the same, except there you'll see, since the receiver is actually moving through the air at a negative velocity, since VRM then will actually be negative 40 because he's coming in in the opposite direction of the wave, then VMR, the velocity of the medium relative to the receiver, will be positive 40. And I should have said that in English before. Like when we flip that negative sign, that's what we're saying physically, that if the receiver sees the air going past him like this, then that, I'm sorry, if the air sees a receiver going like this, then that means the receiver sees the air going like that, right? That's what we're saying here. If you check and just adjust that one minus sign, you'll see that the, the final received frequency is 
instead of being 500, instead of being 58 hertz below 500, you'll see that it's like 58 hertz above. And that'll be a nice check that you understand what you're doing and that's fine. The thing, I mean, that's very fine. Now, the thing I'm gonna say a little bit more quickly than I'd like, where it gets a little bit interesting is if you move over and try the source cases, and this is what you'll think about in lab, I think. So I'm gonna just give an overview of this. It really is kind of the whole point of the lab. So I don't want to give it away anyway, but here's the tricky promise that I'm making you. I promise you that if you follow this procedure that we just did, you do the exact same procedure, even if the source is moving rather than the receiver. Okay, you do the exact same procedure, but really do the exact same procedure. Like don't kid yourself, follow all the steps and you will find, and you'll get the numbers, you'll find that the numbers, might surprise you at the end. I, again, I've got like two minutes. So I'll set you up and show you what I mean. But, but like, if, uh, example. Let's very quickly with like one minute left, just imagine the exact same scenario as before, only this time the speaker is sitting, excuse me, this time the receiver is sitting still in the medium in the air at zero and assume that now the source is moving back at 40 meters per second relative to the air. You know, rather than the receiver moving back at 40, assume that the source is moving back at 40. I'm gonna start you off, we're gonna end class in a second. We're gonna start you off just to show you what I mean by doing the exact same procedure. We're gonna do the same procedure, step one. We're gonna solve for the wavelength of the wave according to the source. So I really mean start at the source again. And you'll say again, VWS plus VSM. Sorry, that's not what I mean. We'll say again, VWM plus VMS over F. And I'm just about to end. I do see the time. I'm just going to do one more line, then you'll have it from here. So just like before, we're going to start exactly the same before. But notice here, in this case, VWM will be 340 again, sure. VW, VMS won't be zero this time. Like here, you're going to put a number in because here the medium is moving relative to the source. If the source is moving back at negative 40 in this case, then the medium relative to the source is moving forward at 40. I'm saying, in short, it's the exact same procedure, but when the receivers move, you have a zero in step one in the numerator, and you don't have a zero in step three. For the source moving, you won't have a zero in step one. You will have a zero in step three. Just to show you, this is why it is a procedure. Like, just as long as you're actually carefully, conservatively doing the same steps every time and not just like memorizing numbers or skipping steps, you'll get it right and you'll get an answer. I'm going to warn you right now, if you're still paying attention, I don't think you're going to get the same answer as you would have for the other case, but you might think that you should, but I don't think you will, but that's the discussion of the lab. But anyway, if you follow the same procedure, you will get answers for any of the cases. You don't have to change a thing. Just resist the temptation. Don't, don't try to tweak the procedure for the case and don't try to skip steps. Okay, that's it. Um, uh, yes, I think so. Yes, I think so, but I actually can't do it in my head that fast, but I think that's right. But yes, sorry, have a great week. I, I can hold on for a second for that question, Sam, or anybody else, but yes, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for indulging me. I'm gonna stop the thing now, but I'm not going anywhere, but you go anywhere, come on. Have a great weekend and good job, Luna, seriously. I'm going blah, 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 blah.